and then go from a decision from there. And my next point would be where I want to go from here is can we do a moratorium on the stopping of putting more polls up? Because... <laughs> <laughs> you hit a chord there. Yeah, because I have two poles in my yard, and I'm pretty sure everybody on my block has two poles. One pole supports SCE. The other shorter and uglier pole supports the old existing wires for Verizon and cable and all that. And when the guy came to do my poll back in February, he says, we will come back in two months and we will unhook the, po the, the wires from the old poles and put it on the new poles so you will only have one pole and I've yet to see that happen. When I, um, let, let me, let, let's give And that. that's where I'm at. Just from here, let, at the very least, let's stop the pole building. Okay, I, I'm gonna ask Jennifer to address that but I wanna make a quick comment. I was really proud of us. We almost made it through the whole meeting without pitting neighbor versus neighbor. In Palm Desert, we don't have rich people, poor people, white people, black people, Hispanic people, whatever. What we have is our fellow neighbors. And let's always remember that, okay? Right. Jennifer. So I, um, just to speak to the stopping to replace poles, we replace poles because they are aging and they are in danger of falling down. So we cannot just simply avoid replacing the poles. We have compliance. We are regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission to replace them. We, we inspect them every three years. So we have to maintain our system. As for the two poles in your yard, that's what we call a joint pole. And we do have a problem with the other utilities relocating when we do a replacement. They're supposed to come behind once they're notified within a two-month period of time to relocate their equipment, we don't relocate their equipment to our pole, the new pole that is our both of our pole. And then once we're notified that they have done that, then we will come and remove that other pole. If that has not happened, please get with local planning and then we can follow up on that joint pole transition. We are doing a lot of pole replacements for very good reason of safety, but those joint poles can stay behind. Well, that... If you would like to, we, we can't avoid replacing poles, and the cost comparison between maintaining our existing system and undergrounding, it, it's very expensive to underground. We have to continue to maintain our system. We cannot simply avoid replacing or maintaining our equipment that exists in the field. Some of these poles have been up for 40, 50, 60 years, and so when they get to a condition where they need to be replaced because it could fall down, then we will replace that pole, and we're required to do so. Thank um, you, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, by the way, that is strictly an Edison issue. Uh, the city, uh, Edison has an easement for wherever you see those poles and lines. The city cannot dictate to Edison whether they replace poles or not. Uh, but that is one of the issues that speaks in favor of undergrounding. We get that. Um, two more questions. Uh, I'm sorry, three. We're going to go with you, sir, then with you, and we're going to finish it up with Judith. Okay. Hi, my name is Kurt Sapolsky. I live on Candlewood Street. Um, along with what you're just saying about maintaining, I'm sure that SCE is going to save a lot of money on maintaining uh, poles from people driving into it and weather and dust and palm trees catching fire. So you'd save a lot of money by undergrounding. And also, has there been any studies to see if underground wires are safer during an earthquake? I would think that if California, since they just got upgraded in earthquake probability today, they would want to see... Um, poles undergrounded if it's going to uh, help everybody if something happens. The question is, is it cheaper to maintain lines once they're underground and how are they affected by earthquake and perhaps other maintenance? So briefly, Jennifer? Yes. Um, so I don't know that there has been a comprehensive study about the safety of underground versus overhead in, in an emergency or an earthquake. Um, that would be something that the CPUC could take up and determine that they want to raise all the ratepayers' rates to be able to undertake that effort. But again, somebody's going to pay for it. You're going to pay through it through rates. So in order to keep our rates down, we really fund a overhead system primarily. Underground systems, we have to also plan for capital replacement in 30 years. They last less time. So while an overhead system will last 50 to 60, maybe even 100 years in some places, an underground system primarily, we're replacing underground systems that are 30, 35 years old because they start to fail. And much of our worst performing circuits are underground systems. So no, they are not less expensive to maintain. Thank you. And is that Susie? It is. Hey Susie, how are you doing? Fine. 
I'm Susie Pete, and I live on Willow Street, and some of you know me from the Neighborhood Watch. And Jennifer, I met you, and I'm finally meeting you in person. Um, my issue is we are not going to be undergrounded for quite a while because it takes so long. Um, but my problem is, is that, yes, you have to maintain poles. And Jennifer, we met, it's been almost three years ago, maybe four years ago, when they were trying to replace a power pole on August 25th, 20th, I think, in the middle of the summer. And I just think that's an issue that Edison doesn't really realize. They're going through California. They don't know that we have extreme heat here. They just say, well, we're going to replace this pole today. And that is a problem I think Edison needs to recognize and actually city manager John Wilmoth was very helpful to me in getting all the information going to make that stop so I just think that's an issue and ironically our power was out for an hour today on the way to get here. So you have the right people to talk to here. <laughs> We're going to wrap up the question and comment portion of our agenda with Judith Bruno. Hi I'm Judith Bruno I live on Candlewood Street. Um, I guess I have a question about the 20A um, possible Deep Canyon issue. I mean, if you drive down Deep Canyon, you look like you're in the third world. There are so many circuits on top of each other, feeding the Vintage Club, which is in Indian Wells. Um, and I'm just wondering if that is a 20A issue. Doesn't it make sense that maybe the blocks on either side could be covered at a greater savings instead of doing it piecemeal like we're talking about, enforcing people to try to organize when it's a very difficult process? Um, Deep Canyon is a major through fare for anyone who is going to South Palm Desert from people from Indian Wells who take Deep Canyon to avoid the lights on Cook Street. It's very dangerous. Um, and on Deep Canyon, uh, two or three years ago, one of the lines actually broke and came down in the street and caused a small fire um, where one week before they had a jumpy house with a dozen kids playing in it. But my question really is if they're gonna address Deep Canyon, why wouldn't they look at the immediate adjacent areas? Because it seems like it would make sense to consolidate that project. Let's start with the first part. How is 20A, which is, the, remember that's the, the, process, the procedure which is funded by Edison completely. How is that initiated? How does somebody apply to, to, to do that? So we would meet with the city and then the city would direct us to evaluate some possible projects, um, given their current allocation, which is, I believe, about 480000 is the accumulation they can mortgage out five years, and the accumulation on an annual basis, if I recall from the numbers, is over 100000 a year. And so we would use that number to um, see if that project would be feasible and if it qualified for Rule 28 funds. So we would just work with the city. The city could direct us to do that, and it's that simple. So very quickly, because I, I don't want to get too deep into uh, or too much into one single area, I think 20A is not about people or number of homes. It's about citywide, is there an impact here that we want to cure? Um, and you know, we, we can explore that area as being a potential target for these funds and for 20A. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you once again to Jennifer, Marilee, um, all of you for being here. Final question comes from me. Where do you want to go from here? Yeah, Judith. Okay, and especially because we have somebody that just flew here from China, and Karen's like had enough. She wants to go home. Um, I will respectfully disagree. I don't think anybody's time has been wasted. Um, I think that this has been valuable. Um, let me just give a moment to my colleague Jan Harnick, and then we'll come back to the question. I, I have one thought. I know this is Fulton and, 
and Miller have taken this on. How many houses were, are in your district? 101. 101. So they, they were successful in their area. And if there would be a way that we could use you as a resource, because I am getting ready to do my neighborhood, uh, but if other people could have access to you, I don't know what you'd be most comfortable in giving contact information, how, how you'd like people to contact you, but they are a great resource. They went through the process. No, it's not fun. No, it's not easy, but it can be done, and there's the proof. So I, I think if we can, what can you provide for other people so that they can get this done. Exactly. Okay, so let me, let me put a suggestion out there. Obviously, I've thought about it. And Judith, I'm, I'm sensitive to what you're saying. I, I, I agree in the sense that we don't want the process to bog down as it has before. There's been limited success in undergrounding, including what Marilee has shared with us, okay? But limited. Part of the challenge is, and it was said here earlier, if we go neighborhood by neighborhood, this could take us into, you know, the next century. So. The suggestion for moving forward so that our efforts this time uh, result with success, more substantive success, um, I'll suggest a working group, a committee, a task force that looks not just at, the, at this option, the 20B that we have, that, that has worked in some cases, but looks at other alternatives with the objective of undergrounding all the remaining uh, above ground poles in the city of Palm Desert. Now, it may be a tweaking of 20B. Maybe we have to aggressively promote it. Maybe we need, the city needs to take the initiative and go around neighborhood to neighborhood and get it done. M uh, maybe, but maybe there's other alternatives. The San Diego option. Maybe we need to look at utility tax, okay? And go ahead and get this thing done. Uh, maybe we need to look at sales tax. Maybe we look at bonding or a citywide assessment district. Each of those alternatives has pluses and minuses. Some may prove unworkable. But maybe the next step coming out of here is to get some knowledgeable people onto a committee and let's identify all the alternatives. It's like brainstorming. Let's put them one through ten. Here's the different ways without evaluating them. Do that and then take the next step, which is look at each one of those alternatives and say, what are the challenges? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? With the ultimate goal of then saying, okay, we pick this one. This is the alternative that we think will work in our city. I will take that to council and say, we've had this ad hoc committee working on this for six months, a year, two years, whatever it takes, and here's our recommendation, and here's why we think this will work. That's where I see the process going. What do you think? Sure. If, if you want to go in that direction, I'll just have a sign-up sheet, and we'll... We can do all that. We can do all that, okay? And especially where there are volunteers and people have expertise, a website may have a cost, but a Facebook page doesn't, right? So there are ways to then spread the knowledge. Those are all things that we can do. Look, there's nothing we can't do, right? We're here. This is our city. We're in charge of our future here. So the suggestion is let's work together. Let's tap into the expertise and the collective experience and history and knowledge that's in this room right now, and let's get this thing done. I know you've heard it before, but I'm new to this relatively, and I was involved since 12, and I want to help you. Okay, so what I'm going to do, do you have a quick comment? Because I want to... We make sure that uh, uh, SoCal Edison also make, gets more involved in terms of their describing what their long-term plans are for tech transmissions, generation, and transmission technology. Because your timeline, you know, So Jennifer said yes, and let me tell you, I've gotten to know Jennifer, and she's really nice and really sweet and really sincere, and she will be a help to our group. Um, and if we can get you involved, and, and certainly Roland and Judith if you want as well. But let me do this. I've got a sign-up sheet here. All I need is your name and email address. We have a council meeting tomorrow. I'll ask them for permission to move forward with a committee, an ad hoc group that will take this forward. Okay? And none of us want to waste our time. I don't believe in meetings for meeting's sake. I don't have the time to do that. Okay? So if we're going to move forward with this, we're going to make sure that it's meaningful, if I can help it. Sound okay? Yeah? Okay. <sighs> we'll get this done.
Thank you again all for being here. I've got the sign-up sheet if you're interested in serving on the committee. Come on up and sign it. Thank you, everyone.